Welcome back to the Live Athletic Podcast. We are here with episode number two. I'm your host, Kyle Arsenal. And today I'm in my uh, my soundproof, super fancy studio. Uh, just kidding. It's just my office off of the uh, the main bedroom in my house here. But to be a little more soundproof than it was for episode one when I was sitting in a park. But anyway, so today what are we going to discuss? We're going to discuss 15 things that over the course of my time being a strength and conditioning professional, uh, working in the health and fitness field, what are 15 things that I see that the most athletic, the healthiest, the strongest, and the leanest people that I've worked with and continue to work with, what do those people do? What do they have in common? Okay, so again, we're going to go over 15 things, and, and hopefully you can take some from that. All right, so we're going to dive right in here. Uh, let's go with number one. The first thing that they do consistently and what is common trait between all of those people that, uh, again, the healthiest, strongest, leanest people, they resistance train three to four times per week. Okay, this is kind of their their thing. They go to it, and uh, as we kind of discussed in episode number one, the resistance training aspect, the strength gain, that that has to be the the foundation, the kind of the cornerstone of your training. So they resistance train three to four times per week, not one time per week, not two times per week, but at least three times per week for most of the year. And that's another point we're we'll gonna get to in a second here. But again, three to four times per week, they are lifting weights. Their goal is to get stronger. Their goal is to gain more muscle mass. That is what they are doing three to four times per week. Okay. With that, number two, they condition at least twice per week. Um, sometimes, you know, that they might get a third conditioning session in there. And I guess it really all depends on what we're labeling conditioning, right? But really for me, conditioning is anything that you're trying to do to challenge your cardiovascular system. And there's different different forms and different methods for challenging that cardiovascular system. That's actually what I wrote about in my, my most recent book. Um, if you want to link to that book, shoot me an email, Kyle at theathleticway.com, and I'll, I'll get that over to you. But anyway, the, those people, they condition at least twice per week in conjunction with their three to four times a week uh, resistance training. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, here's a big one. They do this year round. Okay, so there are no off seasons as far as training goes for these people. They... Yes, life gets busy, of course. They might have some family obligations, some work obligation that kind of shifts around their training schedule and their conditioning schedule maybe a little bit, but that's just a fluctuation in maybe a day or two or a week where the intensity might drop a little bit, maybe the duration of their sessions of training and conditioning drop a little bit. So instead of dedicating an hour three to four times a week, maybe they have to drop their resistance training to a 30 to 45 minute segment, but that's okay. They still get that three to four times per week resistance training in and they still get their conditioning in. And that is year round. Again, no off seasons. These again, we were talking about the healthiest, the leanest, the strongest people that I know. This is what happens. Okay. Number four, when they train, they train with intent. Okay. And what do we mean by that? That is, they're not in there kind of messing around, you know, moving some weight here and there, leaving a bunch of reps left in the tank. When they are training, they are training with intent. They are trying to get to that fatigue point when they are moving weights. When they are conditioning, they know exactly what they're going for. And if they don't know themselves as far as if they are not a health and fitness strength and conditioning professional, they enlist somebody to help them know that. But they get in there. They don't have their phone. They converse maybe a little bit, but it's minimal. They don't take a 10-minute conversation right in the middle of their training session. They are focused, and they get a lot of training density in a short period of time. Okay, so that's number four. Number five. They live an athletic and active lifestyle, okay? So these aren't the guys that, you know, if they have, and guys and, and ladies, of course, that's what I mean by when I say guys, uh, but they, they don't sit down and, and kind of binge watch Netflix or get caught up in the YouTube videos and social media. You know, they don't go down these rabbit holes for an hour or two hours at a time. They're up and they're moving around. They're hiking, they're biking, they're kayaking, they're out with their family, playing in the yard, whatever it might be. These people live an active lifestyle. And that is obviously bolstered and supported by the resistance training conditioning those three to four times a week and then the two times a week conditioning. Okay, so it kind of all plays into this nice little this nice little puzzle that fits together nicely here. Okay, so moving on, that was number five. Number six, they eat plenty of protein and they prioritize it with each meal and snack. Okay, it's no, uh, no mystery. And if you've read anything about nutrition at any time over the last decade or two, You'll know that protein is super important for anybody who is active. I'll say it's super important for anybody, but especially if you're active and you're putting in a high output of physical, mental, emotional kind of challenge on the system, which again, these people are doing. Okay, so they prioritize protein. They eat plenty of it, which means an easy standard and it's lasted through the decades. And that's why it's, uh, it's lasted because it, it works. It's about one gram per ideal pound of body weight. 
So let's say, hey, I'm trying to get to be a 200 pound individual. That's my ideal weight. I'm going to try to consume about 200 grams of protein per day. I know that might sound like a lot, but if you actually start looking at, hey, my high protein food sources, you know, my meats, dairies, uh, protein powders, again, something that we're going to talk about here in a second, you can actually get those those high gram uh, totals. So again, 100, 150, 200 grams, whatever you're shooting for, you can actually get those relatively easily when you are understanding it and prioritizing it. Okay. So again, these people, they eat plenty of protein and they prioritize it. They have it with each meal, each snack. That is kind of the center, the centerfold, the kind of uh, foundation of their meals. Okay. All right. So that was number six. Number seven, with eating plenty of protein, they eat very minimal processed foods. Okay. And if they are eating processed foods, it's very minimally processed foods. Okay. Um, so, you know, really, if you think about all of our uh, big methods on eating recently, these diets, these uh, keto, paleo, vegan, if you look at these, the, the foundation of these methods is non-processed or very low processed foods and our whole food choices. Okay. So again, the, the healthy of us walking around, usually the, the strongest, the leanest, the most muscular, we are not eating a bunch of processed food coming from boxes, having a bunch of chemicals in them, anything like that. We are eating very minimal processed foods, if any processing at all, usually whole food sources. Okay. So your, your meats, your veggies, you know, the, again, minimally processed stuff, cheeses, all those kind of things. Okay. So that's number seven, going right along with the nutrition piece here. Number eight, they limit their food choices. Okay. So I know I've, I've caught a lot of flack for this in my life that, uh, my, my palate is boring, so to speak. And it's not that my palate is boring. Believe me, I enjoy the rich foods and, and all the uniqueness and variety that everybody else does, but it just takes longer and more effort to create different meals every single day. So what do I do? I typically have, you know, one or two choices for breakfast because I'm the one getting up early and feeding myself. Um, you know, I, I am lucky where my wife, Jamie, she, uh, she gets after most of the lunches. So lunches are varied or kind of whatever she's going to make for the day. But then my, my nighttime stuff is all pretty much the same, you know, so I have maybe one or two choices for breakfast, one or two choices for dinner. And then I have kind of a nighttime mini meal is what I call it. You can call it a snack if you want to. And that again is another one to two choices. And it's just easy. It keeps me on point with what I want. Again, hey, my protein intake, my whole food sources, it just makes it that much easier. And to tell you the honest truth, I personally, I've never gotten sick of it. Um, I know that that's not normal, but hey, I'm not normal. What can I say? Okay. But the strongest, the leanest, the most athletic, the healthiest people that I know, they usually limit their food choices or their meals and snacks to just a few. So they know exactly what they're going to be eating each day. Okay. So here, again, going along a little bit more with the nutrition stuff. Number nine, they eat according to their physical output. Okay, so what I mean by this, um, so actually another recent book that was published, and I'll give my wife again, Jamie, pretty much all the credit here. I was just kind of uh, some of the content source and, and making sure that all the, the kind of quote unquote science was, was correct as she's putting this book together. But it was all about carb cycling. And the people that we know that, again, are the, the strongest, the leanest, healthiest, what they do is they're able to manipulate their food intake according to their physical output. So on a training day, one of those three to four resistance training days that they have, they're eating a little bit more carbohydrate. They're taking a little more calorie because their body needs that in order to sustain the physical output, but also then recover from it. On the diet days that they're just conditioning, a low level condition, or they're resting, their caloric intake is lower, their carbohydrate intake is lower. They've really been able to master, again, this fluctuation of, of energy and carbohydrates according to their output. Okay, so basically, if you're training, you're having a, a high physical output, you have a game, a practice for our youth guys, or if you're an adult and you're competing, yeah, sure, you're going to have some higher carbohydrate intake and higher caloric intake on those days. On the days that are off or days that, hey, it's a lower level conditioning day, you can reduce your caloric intake a little bit, you can reduce your carbohydrate intake a bit, and that's going to, again, kind of help you keep that nice insulin sensitivity levels that we were looking for from a health perspective and a, a fat to uh, muscle mass perspective, as well as just your, your overall body composition. Okay. So again, they eat according to their physical output. That was number nine. Number 10, moving on here, guys, we got about five more here. They prepare their meals. Okay. Again, not another shocker, but the guys that, um, so again, this is a puzzle. All this is coming together. They have their limited food choices and then they prepare their meals ahead of time. Okay. So they're not just running around 
starving, grabbing whatever's easiest out of the fridge or, or dial in or ordering online and go and pick up something super easy and convenient. No, they're, they're actually prepping their meals ahead of time. And that doesn't mean you have to sit down for two to three to four hours on a Sunday and put it all together. I've done that before, but that means, hey man, maybe you just, you just prepare your breakfast the night before. So for example, for me, here's, here's my, my breakfast choices for you. It's usually either a Greek yogurt bowl, uh, overnight oats, or a cottage cheese bowl. So literally three options that I have for breakfast, all three of those options I prepare the night before. Because again, getting up at 4.30, if you tell me to get up and make my breakfast, it's going to be hard for me to kind of get up and, and put in that effort. So I'll be more likely to reach for something easy. If I make it the night before, boom, it's sitting there in the fridge. It's ready to go for me. Okay, so they prepare their meals ahead of time. Number 11, kind of wrapping up more of the, the new nutrition piece here. It's kind of the last nutrition point. And it goes along with what we talked about before with eating a lot of protein. They utilize protein powder. Okay, so there's a couple different things that... Um, we typically see when protein powder comes up. Let's start with our youth male. It's like, oh man, hey Kyle, what, what protein powder do I need? I wanna get yoked, I wanna get jacked. How much do I need to take in? How many shakes should I have a day? What, what's the best protein, blah, 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 blah. It's like they look at protein powder and a protein shake almost as a steroid, which it's not, okay? It's a, what I always say to these guys, like, hey man, it's like, you know, chopping up a, a chicken breast, grinding that down, putting in your back pocket, and then chewing on that a little bit later. That's literally what we're trying to use protein powder for is to get these the, the protein intake in, but it's also a nice additive to our whole food nutrition. Okay, so for example, that Greek yogurt bowl that I just mentioned uh, on the last point there, making that in the, in the morning, what I do is I add chocolate protein powder to it. Mix that in, a little cocoa, a little cinnamon, mix that all in. It's actually, it tastes like almost like chocolate pudding, honestly, and it's higher protein count for me. It's, it's healthy because of the, the protein powder that we're getting. Again, it's a minimally processed protein powder. Um, so all these things, but using protein powder to up their protein intake in conjunction with their whole foods. Okay. So again, those of us are the, the strongest, healthiest, most athletic people that I know. Every single one of them uses a protein powder in some fashion. Okay. All right. So following along with the protein powder on the kind of the supplement uh, point number 11, we're going to go into point number 12. Okay. And that is they take vitamin D, zinc and magnesium, fish oil, and creatine. Almost every single one of them that I know have at least these four supplements in their supplement regimen. Okay. Some of them take some extra stuff. Personally, I don't think it's all worth it. Some other stuff does work and it really does all depend on your deficiencies, potential deficiencies. But what we see, uh, the most common areas and, and issues that we see with our current members or anybody again that I've come in contact with low vitamin D, zinc and magnesium is a bit deficient. Your fish oils are just awesome. And they, if they don't take those, or if they don't eat fatty fish uh, for those omega threes, they're, they're lacking in that. And then creatine. Um, so let's just go kind of right along here. So vitamin D, I actually did about a 63 page paper for my senior um, kind of dissertation, senior paper when I was at Keene on vitamin D and performance and health. And it is one of the uh, most underlying and, and kind of now in the in mainstream media, which is good. Um, but back then they didn't really talk about it. It was, and it's linked to a lot of deficiencies, a lot of diseases that we see, but also from a performance standpoint, when we're deficient in vitamin D, most of our systems can't work optimally. Okay. So, and up here, especially in the Northeast where we are, if you're not outside, um, you know, we can only be outside for so many, uh, days of the year here with uh, shorts and a t-shirt on, we have to absorb the, the sunlight for to produce vitamin D naturally. The other six months out of the year, or even honestly during the summer, if you're wearing a lot of sunscreen and stuff like that, you're likely not getting the vitamin D you need. Okay, so that's why supplementing with it is, is, is a solid idea, a good idea. Okay, zinc and, and uh, magnesium, again, two minerals that will typically find people are deficient in. And zinc and magnesium, they play a huge uh, piece in sleep and actually aiding for sleep in recovery. So there's the other big thing. Okay. They help in a lot in recovery. And again, these are minerals that have a play on a lot of different systems, um, in the body. So again, being deficient in those, no good. So we, they supplement with those. Okay. Fish oil. Again, you probably don't need me to talk about fish oil and all the benefits of it. Um, if you want to look it up, literally Google benefits of fish oil, you'll see a million things again, most system, but cardiovascular health, brain health, you know, honestly, there's been some fat body composition stuff that's been linked to fish oil, all that good stuff. Uh, so that, again, that's in their, their supplement regimen. And then creatine, okay, this might be the most uh, publicized and talked about performance supplement. And it's also probably the most misunderstood performance supplement, um, especially by the general population. Okay, so creatine, what does it do? 
uh, to try to break this down without getting too geeky and sciencey on you guys, creatine, you have a what's called your creatine phosphate system. And it's actually an energy system within our cells of our body and our, our muscles and everything that uh, works on a, a short action, meaning that short, intense action. So resistance training, for example, when we are resistance training, we're going through a few reps of an exercise in explosive fashion, we are using our creatine phosphate system to produce energy for our cells. Okay. If you don't have enough creatine, so if you think about the name creatine phosphate system, so half of the system is dependent on creatine and phosphate coming together and then being broken apart and blah, blah, blah. Again, not to get science on it, but creatine, if you're lacking in the abundancy of creatine, you're not going to be able to replenish that creatine phosphate system. So what do we do? We supplement with creatine. Okay. What it does not do, it does not make us stronger all of a sudden and all this stuff, but it actually just allows you to train harder for longer. When we can train harder for longer, we have more of an output more of a stimulus on the system, our body then adapts, we get stronger, we build more muscle, so on and so forth, as long as all the other things on this list are, are in play with the nutrition. Okay, so that's what creatine does. They've also been linking creatine to mitochondrial health, which is our kind of the powerhouse of our cells. They've been linking creatine to cognitive abilities and performance. So it's kind of one of those supplements that we're seeing more and more and bigger and better things coming from it. So one of those ones that, yeah, the, the healthiest, strongest, leanest people that I know, um, supplement with okay all right point 13 14 and 15 coming up here guys okay so point 13 not a lot that needs to be said here but they sleep for seven plus hours a night okay again we can't kind of recover from our days especially if we're having a high physical output without those seven plus hours a night so making sure we're in bed for at least seven hours and not in bed on our phone or watching tv or any of that stuff you're in bed you're doing two things you're sleeping or you're with your significant other and you're you're doing some other stuff that's uh, probably a little bit better than sleep, but at least it helps you get to sleep, right? But, uh, all right. Number 14, de-stress. Okay. Hey, maybe that goes with point number 13, what we just talked about de-stressing. Um, but yeah, so what these guys do, they find ways to de-stress. So that might be going for walks. That might be meditating. That might just be a breathing protocol that they go through. Maybe it's an extra mobility session that they go through for five or 10 minutes a day, but they de-stress and they don't de-stress with alcohol. Okay. Again, um, something that we have seen a lot with some of our adult members is, hey, you know, I have a beer or two or a glass of wine or two a night. It just helps me de-stress from the day. I understand that, but that's obviously a very slippery slope, okay? Not only a, a slippery slope as far as just health and, and you know, even uh, mental health and everything there, but we're also talking about, hey, most of us are looking for optimizing our body composition, less fat, more muscle. It's really, 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 really hard to optimize our metabolic um, output and optimization when we have excess alcohol in the system, okay? And excess alcohol for guys, usually more than two drinks. For ladies, usually more than one drink, okay? So we can kind of go for that. That might've been point number 14.5 because we just talked about alcohol there too, but number point number 14, they de-stress and point 14.5, they don't drink a lot of alcohol. They don't use alcohol to de-stress, okay? All right, and number 15, this is the last point here, guys, that we'll go through today. Again, this I feel like this list could be probably a 105-point list, but we're just going to go through 15 of them. Number 15, they hang around with other healthy, strong, lean, fit, athletic people, okay? You really typically don't see that, again, those of us that are the healthiest, leanest, strongest, hanging out with people that want to binge watch Netflix, want to eat pizza and burritos and whatever for for lunch and you know egos and pop tarts i'm probably kind of like dating myself on this stuff huh? but i know they're still around but you don't see those people hanging around with all those people okay it's not because they're better than them or anything like that but they're just their interest in life kind of fades away from those people and they gravitate towards people who have the same interest when you have the same interests as people and especially if it's in conjunction with their health and fitness and performance goals it is that much easier to be one of those healthy, strong, lean, athletic people. Okay, so there's 15 points, guys, that, uh, again, through my course of being in the strength and conditioning world, the health and fitness performance world, that I see as commonalities between those of us who are the healthiest, strongest, and leanest out there. Okay, um, so go ahead and kind of listen back over that if you want to pick out some points. If you're not doing them, try to implement them. If you want to have some help on trying to implement these into your lifestyle, into your training regimen, whatever it might be, and you are not yet a The Athletic Way member, just shoot me an email, kyle at theathleticway.com, and we can try to get you in for your free eval and success session. That's really how we're going to get started on this path to not only implementing these 15 points, but a bunch more. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's show. If you liked it, go ahead and uh, share it with somebody, friends, family, anybody who you think could use this. 
and we'll be back soon for our episode number three. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Remember, get after it and live athletic. I'm out.